All right, joining us today is Dustin Hobbs. He is running for District 3 for the U.S. House of Representatives representing Nebraska. And we have, as I mentioned, I, I, I would cover this in our introduction today. We have some cool connections going back, Dustin and I. Um, I remember at the Nebraska State Convention, uh, he was the one open carrying a pistol. I love that that happens more at libertarian events than, uh, than than any other kind that I go to. And going even e e deeper in our sort of overlapping stories, I guess, he's also the guy who was featured in the article in The Guardian about Joe Jorgensen talking about the Boogaloo Boys that I did a video on. I believe that was a few weeks ago. Dustin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you again. Can you hear me okay? Lima Charlie, looking, sounding great. Awesome. So, Dustin, I mean, I, I don't know where, where you want to start with this, uh, but, you know, let's let's get the housekeeping out of the way. Who are you? Where are you from? Why are you running for this seat? <laughs> uh, well, I, I almost don't even want to talk about my congressional run right now. I'd rather talk about what you were just talking about, because at the end of the year, who even knows if we're going to have a Congress left anymore? But uh, my name's Dustin Hobbs. Uh, I'm from Nebraska. I'm running for District 3 for the House of Representatives. Uh, I was born and raised here, uh, with the exception of a nine-year stint in the Army when I was stationed in Georgia. Uh, I'm running. Uh, it was mostly due to a ballot access issue, and uh, then I just decided to run with it. Um, but uh, I know that I'm not going to win it. I haven't really been doing much campaigning because right after I filed, I found out my wife was pregnant. So that's kind of taken all of my time and she's, she's due any day now. So, uh, yeah, now, uh <laughs> Dustin, if, if I may interrupt for the sake of our audience here, I want to yes. point out that Dustin is maintaining his race. He's not, mm -hmm. he's not, he's not abandoning it. No. And, it, but, but what he has just said is, is basically I'm dialing down my level of engagement. Right. right. And I, the reason I say that, because uh, it's really not good for promoting your guests to say something like that. Right. <laughs> but for the for both of us, we're not here as politicians. We're not here to blow smoke up each other's butts or fool you into voting for us. That that's not what we do here. But there's a huge point to be made for anybody who's watching who's a libertarian to say, I can do this. I can get out and run for office. Because you can run uh, what you can run, you know, uh, three kinds of, of of races as a libertarian or campaigns, right? You can run balls out to win. You can run various degrees of I'm going to take this seriously and put in a lot of effort to message and take advantage of this opportunity. Or you can run kind of a minimalist paper campaign and say, I'm just going to file and Put up a Facebook page, and I'll, when they come after me, I'll do some interviews, and you know, I'll make sure that everybody, every voter in that area, has the opportunity to cast a vote for a libertarian. And right. even that is critically valuable to the progress of our movement. That we don't let those opportunities go to waste. And mm -hmm. I would, I, I am wholeheartedly supportive of Dustin's strategy, wherever it falls now in that, maybe in that middle category instead of that balls out category. But uh, Dustin, if you would fi finish your intro and, and we'll get back to the bigger topics. Excuse me for that. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that's quite all right. You, you pretty much encapsulated everything that, uh, that, I, that I'm doing right now with this run. It's, uh, it's, it's not balls out. I'm not a man with a whole lot of money to invest into it. And with the upcoming kid, I'm not a man with a whole lot of time to invest in it. I've got a regular, you know, blue collar working man job as a tool and die maker. You know, I'm not living off of uh, political donations. I don't have a pack or anything like that. It's just kind of take it, take it as it is. And, and like you said, you know, even, even filing just a paper candidacy, is uh, it, it's it's crucial, uh, especially in places and, and districts where you have a, effectively a single party rule where you got like a, a Republican incumbent and no Democrat challenger or vice versa. Throwing that second name out there is going to make people like, oh, who is this person? 
you know, what is the libertarian party? What is the philosophy behind libertarianism? And then maybe the next time around, if there's a libertarian candidate for that office or any other office, maybe people will have been uh, sufficiently woken up to vote in that direction. Absolutely. Now, Dustin, the bigger issue that we were talking about before you came on, I think you alluded to it, we might not have a Congress by the end of the year. Uh, I, I want to set you up for this by pointing out that if the system that we're living under, uh, the dollar system, the banking system, the political system, is extremely fragile, and I would say in a sense, it absolutely is. Uh, it, it, it depends on the consent of the public one way or another, which is, uh, you, know, you know, one turn of events can you know, spur a revolution uh, or an American spring, perhaps. And if you were one of the people profiting off the system, one of the major string pullers, and you were operating this fragile system, and there were people out there going, hey, guys. Dollars about to collapse. Things are about to, to just go out the window. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. I mean, even Ron Paul talking about the dollar collapse going back to the seventies when Nixon took us off, took us, you know, took the dollar off the gold standard. Uh, there's an incentive to, 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 in order to stabilize the system, to make people who are pointing out the instability seem crazy to get into that gaslighting, mm -hmm. and. I, 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 you know, it's how the, the, how, how much should we be collapsitarian? Uh, I'll, I'll let you define that and go wherever you want with that, Dustin. Well, you mentioned that the people that are profiting off of the status quo right now, whether or not they would engage in gaslighting to uh, make people who are, who are out there sounding the alarm that the dollar's collapsing, faith in the institutions that we have is collapsing. Um, you also have to maybe realize that it might be a psyop as well, that the people that are profiting off of the status quo right now might have something waiting in the wings so that when this system collapses, they'll be able to profit even more, whether it's profit in a monetary sense or profit in a control of people's life because we have to realize that the people that are at the top of the food chain right now they got more money than god they're not hurting for dollars right now so to them it's it's uh, influence and control is the currency that they peddle in 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 these upper echelons um so we have things like uh the possibility of a government-backed cryptocurrency i've heard the word fed coin floating mm -hmm. around in some of the in some of the circles that uh, things that I listen to, you also have uh, Libra, which was the Facebook equivalent to mm -hmm. a s centralized uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, I'm sure that the International Monetary Fund has something similar. Uh, the European Union probably has something. Uh, all the other major powers in the world undoubtedly are dabbling in blockchain and cryptocurrency. And I am not the guy to talk to about that. I'm a bit of a Luddite when it comes to uh, how cryptocurrency works and, and all of that sort of stuff. But you, you do have to kind of think that the people who are pulling the strings have a contingency plan and a backup for the contingency plan and the contingency plan for that backup plan. Well, the way you, you point out the, the money problem, that they, they have, you know, more money than God. <laughs> it's a funny way of putting it, but it uh, reminds me, what is it? Uh, is it Rockefeller? One of the Rockefellers who said, you know, allow me to control the nation's money supply and I care not who makes its laws. Mayor Amschel Rothschild. Thank you. Thank you. Somewhere, someone, someone a little deeper in the banking Tradition, let's just say, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mayor Rothschild, thank you. And the point of that is, you know, the, the reason, as a libertarian, we uh, we repeat that quote so many times, is that it points out that, it, and it, it you can't use it as a throwaway phrase, right? You really have to explain, you know, what it means, because if you give someone the power to just create money out of nowhere and actually use it as a claim to real material wealth, well, they're going to end up owning everything. And, and it seems like, you know, that's where we're going to today. But Dustin, I, I want to, I want to put you on the spot okay. about your own fear mongering here saying that, you know, cause that really, 
of all the rackets, I'm pretty sure Congress is going to last till next year. I mean, how bad can 2020 get, right? But yeah. Are, are you are, are you serious about that prediction? Do, can, can you admit that when you say, well, we might not have a Congress by next year, like, that's, that's kind hyperbole. of fear-mongering, isn't it? It's it's hyperbole. I I was just you know throwing that out there, but you know again it is it is uh the year that everything that bad that bad that can happen is seems to be happening. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> okay well, do, do me do us a favor then. Take the hyperbole out of that statement and rephrase it in the way that you mean it seriously. What are the cracks in the system that that you are worried about? And and if you want to connect this to your race. You know, maybe you know in Nebraska. You know, we, we talked to uh, uh, Mercedes there, uh, Dan Rutowski, who's running in Nebraska, and uh, a couple other candidates we've interviewed recently. And the food uh, growing and processing element in in Nebraska and a lot of similar, uh, you know, in that region of the country, uh, like shutting down meat packing plants uh, because of COVID. You know, things like that. Uh, so, so please quantify, quantify your fear mongering for us, if you will. All right. Um, yeah. So this election cycle, everybody's focused on the presidential race and what the ramifications of this mail-in voting and voter fraud and voter suppression and everything that has to go along with that. And while everybody's focused on the presidential election, simply because it is so contentious, uh, they're kind of losing sight of the fact that there are other races going on this year and anything that applies to any type of instability with the presidential election also applies to down ballot races as well. So not necessarily saying that the Congress isn't going to exist anymore, but rather that the legitimacy of the Congress that gets elected will be called into question in the same way that the legitimacy of a Trump or Biden or Joe Jorgensen presidency uh, electoral win would as well. So uh, with that being said, you, you have to imagine that if people are, you know, like, let's say on election night, they call it Trump wins, you know, hypothetically. And then you've got already you're seeing the narrative priming taking place in like the Washington Post and a few other places where they are are priming the public for the inevitability that this election is either going to be called into question for reasons of voter fraud or voter suppression, or that we're still counting the mail-in ballots. And then two weeks down the line, Biden wins the electoral college because we, you know, more Democrats mailed in their vote than voted at the polls. So any, anything that has to do with the legitimacy of the presidential election they're also going to call in uh, things like uh, swing state votes for uh, Senate, for House, for even state level uh, state level politicians and political races, because the idea that if the presidential election is called into question or, uh, you know, the, it flips because the mail in ballots were counted two weeks, three weeks, four weeks in middle of January, whatever down the line. Well, is our senator the actual senator that we voted for? Is our congressman the actual congressman that we voted for? And it's going to throw the entire system into chaos if this sort of questioning of of the outcome of the election is going to happen the way that I think it might. Well, yeah, Dustin, I, I didn't expect you to get that specific with this. You know, I thought I thought you were gonna go more general with uh, you know the the bigger dynamics and cracks in the system and things that that we see failing, uh, you know, like uh, you know, food infrastructure, uh, yeah. social services. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, uh, the legal system, you know, denying people access uh, for COVID restrictions, letting inmates out who shouldn't be, things like that. But as long as you want to get that specific with the election, I, yeah, let's let's drill down into this because this, you know, I, I haven't really considered this subject sufficiently. Now, my gut response is they're going to want to make the election look good, right? They they, they don't, as long as as long as a Republican or a Democrat wins, like they don't really care. But they do care that people maintain their general faith in the system. 
How does your theory that uh, we could be facing some significant calling into question of the validity of the results uh, stand up to that counter argument? Well, the the idea is that that idea kind of depends on the people who will be engaging in uh, voter suppression, voter fraud, or or anything like that. Uh, actually benefit from keeping the Democrats or the Republicans in power and making the election look good. Uh, the possibility always exists that there are some type of people in the background that would benefit from the U.S. government system as it stands now, uh, either collapsing or uh, being severely, uh, having the faith in it severely diminished. Um, you, people talk about, you know, like the, the new world order or the globalists or whatever. I know you said you didn't want to get into Alex Jones territory <laughs> or anything like that, but yeah, there, there are collections of people like we just mentioned Rothschild who uh, they're not interested in the, in the specific goings on of a single state just for the sake of that state. They're world minded and to to think that that keeping the United States intact and the faith in the Republican Democrat dichotomy going into this election with all of the chaos that we've seen going on in this in this year and a lot of it seeming to have not been exactly you know grassroots organics you know seems to be somebody behind the scenes pulling the strings yeah. you have to you have to wonder is you know, are they going to cause all of this mayhem, all of this destruction, all of this civil strife and civil unrest only to have an election go off without a hitch and continue business as normal with a Democrat or a Republican heading the state? It, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. I, 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 even there, I got a counter argument for you because I think they will. The, the whole, you know, Hegelian dialectic, pro, uh, dialectic problem, reaction, solution. Yep. If you want to keep this corrupt system and the duopoly going. You really want events to unfold in a way that makes it look like that's the solution. Right. Maybe the solution in their mind is, isn't necessarily keeping the United States as it is now in the state that it is. It's who knows what, what's going to happen after the election, what powers are going to rise, whose influence is going to, you know, bubble up to the surface it's it's anybody's guess you know we we could see some some crazy you know like democratic socialist of america party split off from the democrat party and then suddenly the democrats go away and the dsa is is the second part of the duopoly and then we have this massive overbearing you know santa claus state going to give you everything you want and demand nothing in return on its surface so Dustin, when I when I hear that now now I'm starting I'm starting to see it, you know, I'm starting to see it that we that, that the amount of upheaval that we are experiencing altogether socially, politically, economically seems more likely than not to be uh, to to be able to cause uh, or it seems more likely than not that it will cause over the next uh, six months around the election and seating of the new government in January, new government, that's how they say it in European countries, right? But the seating of the, of the new Congress, at least, and, and, and everybody else taking office uh, for, you know, as a result of the 2020 election. And I, you know, I, you present a dark scenario there. Um, I think if they have to modify their racket, I'm, 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 I'm hoping that it's going to be somehow, you know, uh, if it's not going to be like, like cannabis, for example, I'm sorry, this is a tricky thought for me. Give me a second. I'll, 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 I'll trust me. I'll put this one together. Uh, Your show. Like, Go ahead. Like, with, like with cannabis, in order for government to maintain its racket, they had to say, all right, we're going to give up cannabis prohibition because if we keep going with this in the face of overwhelming undeniable science accessible to everyone on the internet we're going to lose credibility we're going to do it as slowly as possible we're going to keep the racket going as long as possible and even today uh and and, and in case anybody doesn't know this this is worth repeating 
drug arrests over the last few years for cannabis overall nationwide have gone up, not down with the wave of legalization and medical cannabis. They're just arresting people in different circumstances. And so it really isn't a lessening necessarily of the viciousness of the drug war. In fact, it might be worse because schmucks like me now pay $150 to the state for the privilege of having a card that says I'm allowed to consume cannabis, right? So if you, if you ex apply that to the general scenario that you're describing, the general course of human progress would dictate that as we become more aware, the government, in order to maintain its racket as a whole, has to give up certain parts of it. And so I would think that if it's not going to be something positive like that that comes out of 2020, if it's a power grab like we're seeing now, then there's going to be some whiplash awareness effect. At least that's that's what I hope for a silver lining there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And going back to your cannabis uh, cannabis analogy there the when you say that the the main reason that they that they gave up a lot of the the drug war was to maintain some type of uh, semblance of legitimacy and credibility um i maybe i'm just black pilled here but i think that they did it because they realized that they could extract more money and power out of uh tax revenue as well as putting people to sleep because you said that the arrests go up so people aren't as you know out in the streets you know about cannabis legalization they they think yeah, it's well, legal the yeah, well, well hold on dustin i i, I left the point out because i didn't want to get sidebar with cannabis too much i mean libertarian as a libertarian i have a tendency to get sidebarred with cannabis but, it's a big uh, deal <laughs> yeah no but this the the greater widespread ability of cannabis uh, is is already having major positive effects that take power away from key parts of the racket. So while you while while what you just said is generally true, I don't think I could disagree with any of that. You have to take into account that big pharma mm -hmm. is losing a huge chunk of business to cannabis now, and government can't stop that. Basically, in the cabal, the oligopoly of government and its major corporate sponsors. In order to keep the whole thing going, they had they didn't give up the drug war. No. I, li I like to say, like Churchill, we're at the end of the beginning of the end of the war on drugs. And in this first phase, they they, they just cut out the pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. um, the pharmaceutical companies already just because CBD is available at, at a lot of gas stations. In fact, I, I'm pretty sure, like from for my travels, every state where CBD is legal, it's pretty common at gas stations. Um, I, I, they're, I, I'm not trying, I, I don't know. Um, I'm sure Texas is still backwards in a lot of ways and, and Nebraska too on this, right? You guys have the I-80 corridor where people get busted moving cannabis, but child trafficking is more or less happening unencumbered. Unfortunately. Yeah. And I live like 10 miles off of I-80. So, you know, we, we hear about that sometimes. Well, there, there's a big change in subject, Tim. I'm sorry, Dustin. I, I think we've covered a lot, uh, but I, I want to give you a chance to wrap up and maybe go back to, you know, what we were talking about specifically that, that got you on this track about being prepared mm -hmm. and about the emotional element of what it means to be a libertarian activist. All right. Well, if uh, if we're wrapping up here, uh, I just want to uh, do a quick shameless plug for uh, our podcast that we do. It's uh, Roads to Liberty. You can find us on Facebook and we're part of the greater Think Liberty umbrella. You can go to think-liberty.com or you can go to wherever you listen to podcasts at. I think we're on pretty much every single podcasting app right now. We got some some good interviews and some good shows. Uh I co-host one show and I do my own show uh, on Fridays. Uh, hopefully I'll be doing one tonight. I don't exactly have a guest cemented in yet, but also at roads to liberty.com. We have some merchandise there. If you want to go throw some, throw some money our way, we got a, a couple of good designs there. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, the, uh, the libertarian activist thing, um, man, that's, that's one of those things I think that, uh, in a lot of ways, I, I mirror a lot of people is that Ron Paul was sort of my my uh, foot in the door into this whole way of thinking. Um, it's 2007 
I was in a, in a guard tower in central Iraq, looking out over the desert going, what in God's name are we doing here? And that was when Ron Paul was doing his, you know, his starting out his uh, 2008 presidential run. And I started really listening to what he had to say and, and figuring everything out. And that was kind of where I jumped in with both feet. And ever since then, it was, uh, you know, just downhill from there. Well, I guess we share that motivation and perspective, Dustin. You know, one of my favorite things about being a veteran is when I go to the hardware store, and I show him my VA ID card. I ask, do you have a uh, discount for children with special needs? And they know exactly what I'm talking about. Dustin, you have proven yourself, even just in this short interview, to be very thoughtful and, and the kind of deep thinker engaging in the kind of forward-looking analysis that I pride myself in and value in this show. I'm glad that you could join us today. And, and I hope our audience recognizes that you're a, a critical voice to support in this movement and that we need more people thinking on your level. Well, thank you. And uh, if we if we could set up an interview or whatever for you to come on one of our shows, that would be fantastic. Let's do it. Follow for follow. All right. Thank you so much, Dustin.